Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Yusufullah here. So welcome everyone to the first of the two training videos that are accompanying the report. Inshallah in a minute we're going to get to work and we're going to get to work really quickly. I already have a presentation ready for you and it's entitled The Four Stages of Growth. In that presentation we're going to speak about the four stages that you need to get through in order to succeed with your Arabic studies. We're going to talk about their names, what are they? how long they're supposed to last, and also what kind of behavior is required from you in order to uh, successfully move from one stage to the next stage. The startup phase, and then the, rap, uh, the initial growth, followed by the rapid growth, and on to the continuous growth phase. So you've already been exposed to much of this in the report, and you know that what we do is we start with the most elaborate topics up front in the opening days, or in the opening minutes. And what this does is it creates a fascination in the student and it gets them excited and it exposes them to those aspects that truly make Arabic the most superior language on the planet. So once you have that then you get this strong emotional connection with your studies and you're much more likely to succeed. And we follow up with a reading text. So all the theory that's taught uh, in the beginning, it's all with the goal of beginning a reading book as soon as possible because the minute the book begins and the book that we start is this book here it's called Qasas al Nabiyyin and it's by the author Sayyid Abul Hassan Ali al Nadawi and once this book begins then two things happen first of all the enthusiasm level of the student goes through the roof and and because they don't have to wait for the payoff and it's, ho it's happening almost instantly and the second thing that happens is all of the theory that was taught uh, comes to life with real examples and uh, every new detail that's now introduced, it doesn't overwhelm the student and it doesn't discourage them and it doesn't uh, lead to this sense of the language being difficult but instead because they already have a framework of how the language works the new detail then reinforces what was taught earlier and it creates an aha and it creates an epiphany so that's the gist of the method okay it was it was mentioned in the report so there's the elements of the system that yet, that are yet to be given and we're going to start giving them in a few minutes when we get to the training starting with the four stages of growth video okay and all of this will lead to the continuous growth phase and what we mean by continuous growth is that you now have a level of independence and you're able to pick up, pick up the books by the scholars like Imam al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Jarir or one of these other tafsir scholars and you can lie on your bed just imagine lying on your bed and reading 100 pages from Imam al-Alusi talking about some elaborate topic and, and, and you can understand every word that the author is saying because you're able to think at their level so that's what happens when one gets into the continuous growth phase. And, but more importantly, uh, you will get a new insight in your prayer on today and on every day after today. Like for example, when we stand in the Taraweeh prayers, and everybody can relate to this, we've all had this experience, that we're in the last 10 day, nights of Ramadan and the Imam is reciting beautifully. And he comes to a particular verse where he chokes up and he's unable to continue. And he tries again and he chokes up and we can hear him weeping quietly. And we know that there's something there in that verse that led him to that level where he can barely continue. But we can't help but feel foolish because we have no idea what it is. So once you understand the language through the proper approach and you're given this big picture of how the language works and you gain that fascination and you gain that unstoppable momentum and you quickly move through these stages, then you will be able to get those same feelings that the pre-Islamic Arab got when they heard the verses. It comes about the Bedouin that he fell off his camel and he's prostrating and they say, what are you doing? And he says, I'm prostrating to these verses. So, so this is about the time where um, I go a little into my story and speak about what led to this method because many of those that have read the report, um, they say that, you know, obviously there's the incredible amount of teaching that went into that report and um, a lot of thought has gone into it, but more than the thought is the experiences that led to it. So I think I'm going to spend a little time to speak about some of those experiences and share them with you. And I'm going to be mercifully brief here. I don't want to prolong this. I don't want to take up too much time. So here's a short version of it. When I was about nine, okay, my parents, they decided, they were both deeply religious and they've now passed on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive both of them. They made the intention and they decided that I will memorize the Quran. So at the age of nine, I went to India and I was living in a village with my grandfather. And during that year I was there in India, I used to get sick more than I was learning and I was young and I wasn't very disciplined, so that didn't work out too well. So I quickly came back and I went back into the public school system. And then when I was a little older, when I was 13, I went to the UK for my second attempt and that's where, alhamdulillah, I was able to memorize the Quran by the age of 15. Okay, once done with that, I immediately started with the Alim course and we were studying these core sciences of Sarf and Nahu, grammar and morphology. 
and the studies were not all that stimulating. Alhamdulillah, I was above average and I was able to pick up the content very quickly and the studies were not all that stimulating so me and a few buddies of mine used to uh, get involved in activities that weren't all that productive and um, we used to break the rules of the madrasa. The madrasa was particularly strict so every now and then from time to time the management of the madrasa would call my mother and they would remind her of how bad of an influence I was to the rest of the students. Okay, so in the summer of um, 1991, I'll never forget, okay, it was the Eid holidays and um, me and a couple of friends of mine, we had left the premises without permission and we went out and we ran out of money and we weren't able to get back, uh, um, so we walked. We walked over five kilometers to get back and, 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 we, and we reached the masjid at, at 2 a.m. in the morning and I'll never forget that the management of the madrasa were there to welcome us at the door, at the gate and um, they, I had already exhausted my final warning so they made their decision and they decided to expel me. So I packed my bags and I went to the closest, largest institution to apply for admission and they called my mother and my mother, uh, she, she wasn't upset, okay, she was actually happy that that happened because she knew that uh, this is going to become the defining moment in my life. So at any rate, I went to the second madrasa and I applied for a mission. The examiner, the scholar that was taking the exam, was impressed and um, I, I got admission on the spot and I was also eligible to skip a whole year. The next day, uh, the vice principal of this second institution calls me to his office and um, he tells me that we're, we're not able to accept you, okay, because we've done a background check on you and we've become aware of what you were up to and you're not going to be a good influence to the rest of the students. So I was kicked out of there too, okay, without having spent a single day in class. So at that point I was a little upset, okay, because um, I was not the worst of the students. There were, there were many others that were engaging activities far worse than I was, but I used to get caught. But now when I look back at my life, I see that that was the defining moment in my life. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Because what happens in the madrasa system is that teachers that have expertise and strength and talent um, are, and are able to teach the core sciences in the early years of the, of the curriculum, they are quickly promoted. And uh, they're teaching higher level studies in fiqh and hadith and tafsir. And what, what happens is that the students, they lose from this. Okay, the biggest loss is suffered by the students because what, you, what you've lost is a great grammar teacher and what you've gained is a mediocre fifth teacher. So during that same time when all of these events were happening, there was a, a sheikh, a senior scholar, his name was Morana Kamal, Sheikh Kamal, and uh, he, he, he had established a new institute. Okay, and with recommendation from one of my teachers, I was able to get admission there. And this scholar, he's one of the best teachers I've ever, I've ever had, and he too has also passed, uh, passed away now. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also forgive him and grant him a very high um, station in, the, in paradise. So, so I was admitted into that madrasa, and he had gathered his own students who were great teachers in their own right. And anywhere else, these teachers would have been teaching um, you know, advanced topics, advanced books in hadith, fiqh, and tafsir, but I had them teaching me Arabic grammar. So those were the two, three most important years of my life where I picked up a lot of these methods that I'm now using to teach thousands of students. Okay, once I graduated from the UK, I went to Pakistan. Uh, Darulun Karachi, Mufti Taqi Usman is my teacher, and Morana Sahba Mahmoud, uh, and um, Morana Shamsul Haq. And, and both of those scholars have also now passed on. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them a high rank in, the, in paradise. So when I was there in Karachi, I made a couple of observations. I saw that there were older, more mature students that had graduated from Western universities and that had taken time off from their jobs uh, in order to study. So they were enrolling into the madrasa because they understood that Arabic is the first thing that the scholars study and they continue studying it for the rest of their lives. And they knew that Arabic is the gateway to the rest of the sciences. But their situation would become far worse before it ever got better. And let me tell you what I mean by that. They would be placing classes with 16 year olds where the teacher, the ustad, would be forced to teach at the level of the lowest common denominator and these brothers would become frustrated. And you can imagine how frustrated one gets if they're willing to move quickly but they're being held back because the teacher is not catering to their learning style. So these brothers would soon lose their momentum and they would, their enthusiasm levels would drop and they would quit and they would withdraw from the madrasa altogether and they would quit their studies. So I observed this multiple times and from that, from that time I made the intention that I need to come up with a method that would make all of this accessible to, to the western audience, to the more mature audience that are not able to uh, realistically enroll in a madrasa. 
And this is what I've been doing ever since for the last 10 years. And Alhamdulillah, it's, uh, it started with four students from, my, from the basement of my house, where I gathered these four students who were slightly younger than I was. And I taught them one year from my basement. And in the span of that one year, we covered 16 texts. And that was phenomenal because it was uh, already 300% faster than how I was taught. So I, w I reflect on the reasons of how that was possible. And I came to the realization that first and foremost, it was the maturity level of the students that made that possible. Okay, because these are students that their study hab habits are already developed. So what they need is they need a more custom approach. So if you read the report, and an incredible amount of teaching happened in that report, and you will notice that um, you know, it doesn't follow any format of a textbook. But instead, it's not based on any textbook whatsoever. It's basically just um, a transcript of the lectures, and this is how I've been, I've been teaching for the last 10 years. So, so these ma more mature students, what they need is a more custom approach, and this is what I developed and I have been refining for the last 10 years now. And every few months, I recreate the content from scratch. I scrap the material, tear it down, and I recreate it from scratch because we have this continuous feedback loop where the students, they tell us what, need, what we need to change. And we introduce new elements like transcripts and, um, and, and the videos themselves because first it was all live. All the teaching was live and then it went on to MP3 files and now we have video training uh, like, like the one I'm about to take, to, uh, take you to in a minute. So with all of that said, inshallah, we can now move forward with the training. After this video, there's going to be one more. And after that, I am going to um, explain to you how you can sign up for the program formally and get lifetime access to all of the materials that we have. So more on that, inshallah, later. So first, uh, without, without any further ado, let's go to the four, trainings, uh, four stages of growth video. And I'll continue speaking with you there. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.